there are three fundamental forces at work that are going to have a deep impact on education in the state. One is a rapidly aging white population. As those folks age, move out of the workforce, they're going to be more reluctant, frankly, to pay those taxes which sustain our schools. And the fact that their kids are grown up and half of them are going to leave these communities, they're going to leave the state, that means that there are going to be fewer of those people around to have children to come along to attend our schools. So really it's just a matter of time before we have more consolidation. Everybody knows this, except nobody likes to talk about it. It's a very painful subject. I respect that. Nobody likes to talk about it, particularly in rural areas. But it is inevitable. Uh, great sharing is happening all over the place because you have downward trends in terms of total, total enrollments in a lot of these rural districts. Now what's sustaining a lot of them, of course, and actually growing many of them is, of course, the influx of immigrants and refugees. But you also have issues there in terms of the added cost of ELL instruction, uh, interpretation, of bilingual aids, and that sort of thing. And of course you have all the other challenges associated with having this micro plurality as well. You're going to have continued growth in school districts in urban and suburban areas. Most urban and suburban areas in the state will continue to see at least modest growth. We, can, we anticipate that those school systems will continue to be relatively healthy in terms of enrollment. But all you have to do is look at a map of Iowa over the last 10 to 15, even 20 years, and see how the rural areas are becoming depopulated and the concentration of the population is slowly but surely moving into the, to the urban areas, which means, of course, that we're going to have basically three kinds of school districts in the future. You're going to have at one end, you're going to have those that are predominantly urban or suburban that are going to maintain their enrollments or they're going to grow in the foreseeable future. The other extreme, you have that growing list of rural smaller districts which are struggling, which will have declining uh, sizes of graduating classes. They will be forced into a position to consolidate great share, share resources, and that sort of thing. Again, recognizing with all respect that this is an extremely painful prospect, but nonetheless, in reality, this is, is, this is inevitable. What you have in the middle are the other kinds of districts like the Storm Lakes and the Perrys and the Denisons and the Marshalltowns and the, and the Postvilles where you've had influxes of people who are predominantly non-European, there are exceptions, non-European, who are coming with this micro plurality, who speak lots of different languages. And so what's happened is you have more kids coming in, you have more adults coming in, you're revitalizing the local economy and you're revitalizing the local school enrollments. Recognizing the fact though that of course most of those newcomers who are sustaining or even growing your enrollments come with their own sets of challenges. Two-thirds of the state's total uh, population growth was due to immigration. Of course, the bulk of that was actually due to the tremendous influx of Latinos. So Iowa actually, if, if you look back at, again, the census data between 1990 and 2000, Iowa actually ranked 11th in the country in terms of the percentage growth of its, of its non-white Hispanic population. We were just a few, probably 10 or 15,000 uh, more Hispanics away from actually being in the top 10. Uh, typically with the early European immigration to Iowa, it actually took two or three generations before English was the dominant language in the household. You still had newspapers being printed in German and other languages right through the 50s. So that was a stubborn thing. In fact, uh, there's a very, very important episode in Iowa's history when uh, in the, during World War I, uh, the then Governor Harding of Iowa in, uh, uh, instituted what we call the so-called Babel Proclamation, where he made it illegal for Iowans to speak in public any language other than English. <laughs> And of course, there was a great deal of resistance to this because Iowans still spoke for the most part. They were still speaking languages other than English in their churches and their homes and a lot of workplaces and so forth. And so, ironically, the real push against making the official, you know, English being the official language is actually from the Europeans who still spoke European languages. And some of them went to court, some of them there was kind of de facto civil disobedience. Uh, and it, you know, and ultimately that proclamation was withdrawn and so forth. But nonetheless, it was it's really very ironic that more than a hundred years ago, the people who really fought against making English the official language 
who are actually the forebears of most Iowans, who 100 years ago were speaking Danish in church or Norwegian in church and so forth.